Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Welcome to the Armor of Faith, a show where we hope to bring our listeners closer to the Word of God and the blessings we receive through living in the fullness of the Catholic faith. My name is Doug, and I'll be your host today as we discuss the blessings of the Church Christ built upon Peter. And I'm joined by my panel, which includes Helen Hawkins, as well as my lovely wife, Sharon. And Helen is a lay Dominican and has a love for music ministry. And the Dominicans, I always mention, are also known as the Order of Preachers. Sharon is still our token cradle Catholic, and as everyone knows by now, I'm simply here to ask questions and mangle pronunciations of names and things like that. Anyway, to answer my questions and correct my pronunciation is why we have our panelists. So welcome to our panelists, as well as to our listeners. Let us open with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we lift up our hearts in thanks and praise for this opportunity to open and share your holy word this day. We pray that you are with us and all our listeners as we share with one another the blessings of faith. We pray you will grant us wisdom and understanding as we seek to learn your holy truth. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray, amen. And we'd like to thank everybody for joining us today as we celebrate our Independence Day. It's a special day for our nation. It's an opportunity for our nation to, to come together uh, in unity and, and celebrate the freedoms that we have, as well as those who fought and died for those freedoms. So keep them in your prayers, uh, all those, those souls that have, um, that have defended our nation. We also have a couple of uh, event announcements to uh, present. Uh, the first one I tried to announce last time, which was the Christ the King of Mercy, and I had picked up the wrong brochure and, and had the wrong year on it. So anyway, I've, I've got the correct information this time. It's the 22nd Annual Conference. It'll be presented um, July 31st through August 4th, um, and it's presented by the St. Thomas Aquinas Society, and they'll be uh, presenting the conference at the Pike Speak Center in Colorado Springs, Colorado. The conference presents a number of high-powered speakers and topics concerning our faith, as well as contemporary issues. And it also includes a free concert by Tony Melendez, uh, who was born without arms and taught himself to play guitar with his toes. And Tony has played in all 50 states, as well as 44 foreign countries, and is also a performer before St. John Paul II. For more information as to speakers and schedule, you can visit stthomasaquinassociety.org online. Another one is the 20th Annual Midwest Catholic Family Conference that will be uh, presented approximately the same time, just in a different part of the country. Um, their uh, conference will be conducted August 2nd to the 4th in Wichita, Kansas. This conference also includes a number of high-powered speakers, and new this year, the conference will include a Spanish Catholic Family Conference in the Exhibition Hall featuring special talks and programs. This weekend includes presentations by world-renowned speakers for adults, young adults, as well as religious. Special programs address the needs of faith for students in high school, middle school, and elementary grades. To learn more about this conference, you can visit catholicfamilyconference.org. So we come to that part of the show where Sharon gets to tell us why Catholics do what we do. So Sharon, it's all yours. Okay. Today's question is, why do we use candles, and what is their purpose? <clears throat> Have you ever paid attention to the number of candles inside a Catholic church? If not, check it out. They seem to be everywhere. Think of all those candles. Um, think all those candles are the same. There are liturgical candles, processional candles, a sanctuary candle, votive candles, Advent and Lent candles, and, and the Paschal candle. All of these candles are used for different reasons, and some are different times of the year. Today, let us talk about votive candles. A votive candle refers to a vow or a fulfillment of a vow. The Latin word votum means to give honor to a manifest devotion. Votive candles come in two sizes, large and small. 
The small candles are de designed to burn for about 24 hours, and the large candles burn for seven days. The Catholic tradition teaches us to honor others by lighting a candle and asking for God to intervene when some need is at hand. You can find votive candles in any Catholic church that you enter. There is no set requirement for the placement of these of votive candles. However, most often they are placed surrounding the statue. The church may have a special devotion to a particular saint and thus will place candles around that statue. The candles are placed on a stand that is easily accessible to the worshipers. Most often the stands are made of a metal material. This allows for beauty and for fire mitigation. We certainly do not want fires to break out in our churches. There are long sticks, which are lighting, which are lighting sticks. These you can touch to another lighted candle and carry this flame to the candle you are lighting. Then replace the stick to the holder. The tradition of lighting candles goes way back. In the Old Testament, there are references to, quote, keep a flame burning perpetually. That's in Exodus 27, verses 19 to 20. As perpetual incense before the Lord from generation to generation. Also in Exodus chapter 30. And as a lampstand for the tent of meeting, set up before the Lord as he has commanded Moses. Exodus 40 verse 24 to 25. The New Testament continues to show how candles have been used as a first tent was prepared with the lamp stand, the table and the bread of the presence. This is called the holy place in Hebrews 9, verse 2. In, Cal in today's Catholic tradition, this light is a very special place because it symbolizes Christ who said, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have light and life. John 8, verse 12. We light candles before images and statues of our Lord, our Lady, and the saints, not as an attempt to worship, but as a symbol of the light of faith with which we ask for God's help. The flame refers to the Old Testament offering of a burnt sacrifice made in petition adoration, or reparation for sins. We normally see votive candles in churches, but people also choose to use devotional candles at home and place them in a prayer corner or on a table while they pray. Yes, we can pray without candles. However, the act of lighting the candle is an opportunity for us to bring ourselves entirely, body, mind, heart, and soul, into the act of praying. Votive candles are sacramentals that we use to help us focus on our prayers. Every Catholic home should have at least one blessed candle on hand. If you would like to learn more about the Catholic use of the votive candles, okay. we invite you to follow the links in the reference section of the topic summary for this show. And you can obtain the topic summary by visiting wcataradio.com backslash Armor of Faith Study Guides and look for episode 101. So it's not exactly a study guide, but close enough. <laughs> and just, just as a side note, when, when Doug and I do our prayers in the morning, Doug is, always lights a candle just to have the light of, of God present with us. The so last time I mentioned that the <clears throat> temptation, as we see many things in our society going in the wrong direction, is to despair that there is no hope. Or the other temptation is to believe we can do nothing. And indeed, as we watch the politics of our day, it's easy to see why the average person feels powerless in the face of ideologies and media fads. While the situation may be dire, there is hope as we seek to learn and share what God asks us. We must remember, Scripture is filled with examples where God has worked through the faithful, the lowly, and the remnant few. But we must be prepared to roll up our sleeves so we may be participants in the efforts to accomplish his will. The relationship challenges we face today in our society will not be corrected overnight, nor will they be corrected by any government or a political organization. It will only be corrected as we, the children of God's creation, engage one another according to the love which God asks of us for him and one another. 
It is also a generational effort where we must teach our children and communicate across the generations to encourage one another to share the blessings of living the fullness of our faith. As we engage our youth, we must lovingly help them understand what God asks of us in our relationships, especially the relationships which may lead to the vocation of married life. Within Humanae Vitae, Pope Paul VI expressed his concern that governments would be tempted to abuse their power and impose solutions contrary to the natural law. Before we talk about the potential abuses, we should first examine the purpose of government and who it represents. This is a fitting discussion for today as we celebrate the 4th of July, for the Declaration of Independence marks a point in history where a people declared independence from what was perceived to be an oppressive sovereign, stating, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. And of course, those causes were enumerated in the Declaration of Independence. But some very important words in this statement, the laws of nature and of nature's God, which basically means the laws of nature are God's laws. And so we refer to them as the natural law. So from the first time people agreed together or were coerced to give authority to a sovereign or representatives to manage affairs for a populace, there have been many philosophies as to the just roles and responsibilities of government. Some believe government should serve the people, while others believe the populace is there to serve the ideologies of the ruling class. So from the perspective of the average person, what are the basic roles of government we should expect? Well, I would think that a government is there to protect the rights of, of the citizens, freedom, not necessarily freedom to do everything we want, but be able to follow the freedom of the dictates of our conscience and general liberties of people. Also, life and property and opportunities for advancement and, and growth in each individual's life. Yeah, and that opportunity to be able to to share uh, in our relationships, uh, to share the blessings of our religion, um, to 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 you know, there's a variety of opportunities where we can uh, advance and grow both as individuals uh, as well as families, communities, uh, and as as a nation. Uh, and and also, right, and then, oh, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was thinking practical ways, too, such as the infrastructure, road, and things that would be very difficult for, for uh, uh, individuals or even companies to connect an entire country such as ours with uh, highways and railroads and things. Uh, government would be very helpful in that, that endeavor as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, it... it it needs to represent our common interests to the rest of the world, to, to other nations, uh, to other governments. Um, and as you mentioned, its management of our infrastructure um, enables both the, the economy um, as, as well as our ability to uh, interact with one another uh, as people within, within the nation. And, of course, we look to our government to be able to provide the, the policies that enable us to manage our resources for the common good um, and also policies to enable our, our economic development uh, as a nation, to be able to uh, enable entrepreneurs to be able to begin businesses that generate creativity of a variety of areas and arenas but all, that allows us to uh, advance in our technologies as well as advance in our relationships. So a government creates an environment for the people if we think about it. Uh, it creates an environment that can be oppressive or it can create an, an environment that can can be inspiring to its populace. And and ultimately, that's what we're looking for in a government is, is a government that 
will represent the people that will give them an equal opportunity um, to, to apply the gifts and talents that God has given them uh, to be able to interact, like I said, as individuals, families, and communities, and as a nation. Yeah, and so, I would also think the government's role is to protect the people from a ruthless, uh, a ruthless subset. Whether what, there's many, many concepts of that, but a government should also be there to protect the weakest of of its people. Mm-hmm. The most defenseless among us, and and that means uh, you know those who may be, be afflicted in, in a variety of ways, um, but it it provides the environment. Um, and it provides the environment by which we can exercise our faith uh, and exercise it freely without fear of persecution. And, of course, a lot of these things that we're talking about are ideals. They're a lot easier said than done. But we certainly can have this expectation of our government, and there are means by which we can hold them accountable um, to that, uh, you know, writing them periodically and, and uh uh, encouraging them in those things that we see that they're doing right. And, you know, we kind of forget that part of it. And sometimes it's a good thing to write your representatives and say, thank you for whatever, you know, programs are processed, as well as the times that we write them and say, we would like your support um, uh, for, for protecting this right or this freedom or, or, or what have you. And, of course, we see in our, you know, our current politically charged environment that it can be quite a challenge um, as as a government is pulled to its extremes, it's, as, as it gets, you know, as it um, uh, get it gets into the, the the middle of trying to unite a nation to common causes or common goods, and yet we, you know, our politicians try to pull us in, in different directions. So it can be a very difficult task. And so in our discussion today, you know, I want to point out that that governments are not in necessarily by themselves evil, but we can allow evil through corruption to creep into our government, and that doesn't work out well for the people. And so the people have to be engaged. They have to be involved if they want a, um, a good government, if they want a government that is going to represent their interests as opposed to governments that fall to, to temptations of oppression. So if we look a little bit further into the Declaration of Independence, we we see these words. It says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Of course, the term government implies representation or control of those governed. So who and what do governments represent? Well, I, I don't know that I can answer that one because I've been feeling like I'm not being well represented anywhere. <laughs> and, you know, I, when I was a kid, we were taught that when we voted, we elected people to represent us and our thinking and our ideas, that they were people who who thought, who thought like we did, or something close to that. And now it seems that we elect people and they go off and do really different mm-hmm. things. They're, they're not really truly representing us. Um, but that being said, who do they represent? They're supposed to represent the ruling class. In our country, however, they seem to have become the ruling class. They've made themselves the ruling class over the people. That they're supposed to represent national interest, cultural interest. They're supposed to represent the people. And that doesn't always happen. And that's that's an unfortunate thing about our current government status. Yeah, that's one of the challenges for government is because as they they provide that environment of which I've been talking about, that there are different interests. And the, the challenge before us right now are the different ideologies that are in place. So there's, there's always going to be someone within that 
you know, it, it was like what Abraham Lincoln said, is just that you can, um, uh, well, it was more along lines of uh, you can you can please some of the people, you, you can please all the people some of the time, and some of the people all the time, but you can't please all the people all the time. And so that's why we elect representatives to be able to go in and, and evaluate the, the needs of the people um, and to, to represent uh, the populations. Um, but in our, in our system of government, isn't that they just represent the majority? Uh, and while I do have to consider the, the majority's needs, they also have to consider the, uh, the safety and security of the minority as well. And they also have to give equality to opportunity. Unfortunately, we, our, um, our political parties have become parties that are driven more by ideology than by desire for service to the people. And that is also now carried over into uh, our, our media uh, in a variety of ways. And so it's created a polarized situation within our nation. But as I've mentioned before, it's not a matter of whether uh, progressives or conservatives, the right or left, or, or this organization or that organization is right or wrong. It's more a matter of do we understand what God asks us? And, and we as a people need to spend time uh, discerning that question. Do we understand what God asks of us? And then we need to encourage our governments, those governmental representatives for us, to represent what God asks of us. And I know there's a resistance, you know, by, by some to say that, you know, for, for separation of church and state, um, and, and all those those good words, but the reality is, is is that if we as a nation are are working in the direction of things that God asks of us, then that that whole separation of church and state issue is not so much of an issue. It's the separation of church and state is really was really designed to prevent persecution of uh, of the different religions, you know, or for a state. And in particular, when they were looking back towards England and the, and, uh, the sovereign that they were di- kind of divorcing themselves from, if you will, um, was because of the fact of, a, of an abuse of power and also of the persecution of religions. In other words, they established one stain spots for religion and everybody else would, you know, if they didn't subscribe to that, they could be deprived of their life, liberty, um, property, or pursuit of happiness without due process uh, in a lot of cases. And so our system of government was set up and established to prevent those types of governmental abuses um, where the government would either try to run a religion, um, dictate to a religion, or would persecute those who didn't subscribe to the quote-unquote state-sponsored religion. So the First Amendment of the Constitution was really designed to constrain our government so that it could not abuse its people based upon religion. And, and it, you know, we, I, I could probably go on for a long period of time on that, but, it's, yes, but it is, it is um, <laughs> because you've heard me. <laughs> so, but the reality is, is, is that, you know, the, the ruling class, of course, is, is, makes up our government. Um, it represents the, the communications of the ruling class, if you will. Uh, really what it should be more of a representative form of government not, and not a ruling class. That was the intention of our founding fathers. They were very distrustful of the establishment of a ruling class. Unfortunately, our political parties seem to have found a way to kind of circumvent, circumvent that in a lot of ways, and we were warned about that by some of the early fathers uh, who talked about the dangers of political parties. But um, fortunately, they put other checks and balances into the system for us that prevents the ruling class, hopefully, from becoming an oppressive ruling class. And, of course, they have to represent our national interests, um, uh, particularly as, as they interface with, with uh, the remainder of the world. And then we, particularly as a nation um, that, that has been, been formed uh, through immigration, there's a variety of cultures that are represented here within our nation. And, and we have a diverse culture uh, that we should be able to, to celebrate. We should be able to share with one another the blessings of our cultures um, and uh, as a result of that, um, uh, it, we, we shouldn't impose 
cultures on people, we, we should be able to celebrate the diversity of cultures and draw from the diversity of cultures that exist within our nation. Of course, there's always going to be some special interest of one form or fashion as, as people have uh, uh, interests in, in a variety of areas, you know, very, you know, interests either in science, interests in, uh, uh, in different uh, areas of, of business and things like that, all special interests. You know, we, 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 we have this um, concern because we do see special interests at times raise their head uh, and cause it a, a lot of disruption. But that is part of what a government is, is supposed to be capable of doing, is providing means to reconcile differences among special interests. And so, so they do represent special issues in a variety of ways. But the most important representation that our government should have is for the needs of the people in a variety of perspectives. That doesn't mean that they, they provide for every need from cradle to grave. That's... Uh, you know, that basically means turning our, our freedom over to the government, and that's not the way our government was set up. Our government was set to provide an environment for us so that we can take advantage of the opportunities that surround us to be able to work, learn, and grow, as well as be able to, to live the fullness of our faith. So they need to provide a positive environment for us, um, but the people also need to recognize their part in being able to provide for this government their part in making sure that they're aware of the issues um, as, they, as they consider voting for the representatives and who is going to represent them uh, in the consideration of those issues. But also our role is, as a people to come together sometimes in public service, volunteerism, uh, in a variety of capacities, uh, to be able to, to provide for the needs for the less fortunate and the like. And we do that through, uh, through our charities, through our parishes, uh, our churches, um, but it, the first thing that we, we really should should be asking ourselves uh, as a people is, do we understand what God asks of us, and do we understand how God asks us to care for one another? Um, and if we do, then we will do a better job in terms of encouraging and managing our government. It is the people's responsibility to encourage and manage our government. Um, because if we have a government that is of the people and for the people and by the people, the people have to participate. Um, in, and they have to be able to communicate to its representatives as to the environment that we want the government to provide for us to enable us as a nation and to enable us as leaders um, uh, and encouragers of other governments in the world to prevent, to prevent oppressive governments. So let's take a little bit of a look into Scripture, and let's look in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 to 9. And it states, In his old age, Samuel appointed his sons judges over Israel. His firstborn was named Joel, his second son, Ab Abijah. There I go, mispronouncing the names again. <laughs> and they judged at Beersheba. His sons did not allow, follow his example but looked to their own gain, accepting bribes and perverting justice. Therefore, all the elders of Israel assembled and went to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Now that you are old and your sons do not follow your example, appoint a king over us, like all the nations, to rule us. Samuel was displeased when they said, Give us a king to rule us. But he prayed to the Lord. The Lord said, Listen to whatever the people say. You are not the one they are rejecting. They are rejecting me as their king. They are acting toward you just as they have acted from the day I brought them up from Egypt to this very day, deserting me to serve other gods. Now listen to them, but at the same time, give them a solemn warning in informing them of the rights of the king who will rule them. So the scripture continues in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 10 to 18, as to that message of the Lord. And Samuel delivered the message of the Lord in full to those who were asking him for a king. He told them, the governance of the king who will rule you will be as follows. He will take your sons and assign them to his chariots and horses, and they will run before his chariot. He will appoint them from among them his commanders of thousands and of hundreds. He will make them do his plowing and harvesting and produce his weapons of war and chariotry. He will use your daughters as perfumers, cooks, and bakers. He will take your best fields, vineyards, and olive groves, 
and give them to his servants. He will tithe your crops and grape harvests to give to his officials and his servants. He will take your male and female slaves as well as your best oxen and donkeys and use them to do his work. He will also tithe your flocks. As for you, you will become his slaves. On that day, you will cry out because of the king whom you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you on that day. So the regulators and implementers of government are accountable first to God, for it is the children of his creation for which they are charged to care. But they often fail to recognize or may even gloss over this when they impose solution in opposition to God's design and natural law. So what are the temptations which drive governments to abuse their power? Well, the, the temptation, I think, basically is, uh, of course, we're talking about the people. I mean, a government is, is made up of people. It's the temptation of individual people or a group of people who believe that they are God and that uh, and they have uh, changed the whole concept of who, of the, the, that they work for the people they are God, and they, and this is the temptation. It doesn't always have to follow, but the country then belongs to them. And uh, you also many many times you might find in the government people like uh, Samuel Sums who really don't care. They're just in it for what they can get out of it. So uh, when you follow this. Uh, scripture, or when I when I read it or look at it, I realize that things don't change very much. The same sort of people can always get into government and and take what is good there and turn it over to themselves. They can take those bribes and that that uh, we were just reading about, and uh, to do to do the bidding to do you know take the bribe and, and do what somebody in power, somebody who's rich, wants done. Yeah, it's that old cliche that, you know, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so power in itself can be a temptation. You know, it's, it's the power of the belief that I can just impose my ideology. I don't have to encourage the people or, or even take time to explain it to the people. Um, any of the, the benefits... And the reality is, this is that it is the people who should end up curbing ideologies, because ideologies are men's best guess of of how they can make things work um, in in a variety of and this, you know this is the ideologies behind socialism or communism or even our 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 uh, republican form of government, um, uh, you know where we have representatives of the republic that look after our affairs. Um, and so the temp- one of the temptations is, is for those in power to try to perpetuate their power. Um, and, and, of course, those who are in positions of power, those who hold those representative positions, they are they're facing an onslaught of any number of people that want to influence their decisions and how are they going to make policy. And so it can be the ideology of the influencers, if you will, people that are in positions to, like you say, offer that, that bribery. Um, now, in some cases, it, it, that can be, there is no black and white line, if you will, um, but we can clearly know when abuses are starting to occur because when we start picking winners and losers and somebody is officially a loser, uh, and somebody's habitually a learner um, and a winner, um, then we start seeing a, a particular problem arising there in the interest of all are not being considered when we're represented. You know, if we look back in that, that scripture, when we, we look at um, this warning uh, about um, the king who will rule over you, that he can come and take your, your sons and daughters. He can come and take basically everything that you have and own and convert it for whatever use the sovereign believes is, 
is important. Now, there's times where that might be necessary. You know, when we, we think in terms of, of uh, declaring martial law, where the government may need to be able to marshal a defense against uh, a threat to the nation, that it may have to come in and, and gather resources of the people to be able to accomplish that. We're very concerned about that when those situations begin to arise. Those are powers that we offer to our government, but we also have to ensure against their abuse. Um, things, powers like public domain, we have to ensure against their abuse. And one of the ways that we're able to do that within our form of government is that um, we, we have certain limitations. You know, we have certain time periods where the people come back and periodically reassess and vote on the person that is, that is representing them. Um, and if they aren't representing them very well, they can remove them from office. So maybe even in some circles we are able to do recalls. Uh, if necessary. It's those types of checks and balances that eventually uh, um, protect the, the people overall. There also may be, um, you know, one of, one of the things that, that causes governments to overreact are when there's attack from opponents, um, particularly if it involves terrorist attacks uh, or declarations of war. Um, but then there can also be uh, other nations that become political opponents from ours. Um, all these things can cause a government to overreact in defense of its own power, not considering um, the, the consequences for the freedoms and liberties of its people. So it, 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 can, be, it can be challenging when we talk about the faults and frailties of the human experience that we can succumb to these temptations like we succumb to any other temptation in life. And so that's why it's important for the people to be engaged with their government so that the government does not become so out of touch with the people that it no longer represents the needs and interests of the people. And, um, and like I say, sometimes pick certain groups of people uh, under their, their purview as constant losers while they pick others as constant winners. It has to be an environment that is equitable for uh, all of the people. And sometimes they can't serve the interests of all the people all the time, but they really need to try to serve as many needs as, as possible, or at least create an environment where the people have, again, an, an equal opportunity to work, learn, and grow, uh, as well as worship God. The other thing that we might experience, too, are environmental pressures that the, the government has to uh, address that people might not be able to, to address entirely on their own. You know, we have to be able to provide for a positive environment uh, and management of our natural resources. Um, but we also have to make sure that when we do that, that uh, we, we, again, look at the fact that we provide for the ability of the, the people. Uh, we, we don't impose everything upon the people uh, in ways that uh, deprives them, again, of life, liberty, um, and property without due process of law. So let's, let's start talking about... Um, the potential abuses that we might experience from, from governments that Pope Paul VI was concerned about. And one of those areas is, is from those that, who subscribe to the population control ideologies. And there is a, uh, a gentleman by the name of Stephen Mosier, who is the president of the Popular Research Institute, uh, who stated population control programs are always a matter of a majority, be it ethnic, religious, or class-based, targeting a minority. Nowhere is this more clearly illustrated than in northern Burma, where an ethnic, ethnic and religious ethnic majority is targeting a despised ethnic and a religious minority. The goal is to clearly eliminate the Rohingya from Burma by any means possible, including contracepting and sterilizing their children out of existence. So, this statement by the president of the Population Research Institute basically reveals to us that the methods of population control can become an, a, a, an abuse of power by the majority or basically the strong over the weak. 
So let's ask that question. What is the responsibility of the strong for the weak? Well, to me, it seems obvious, that, <laughs> although I realize that's idealistic, the, the strong should be there to uphold and to help the weak and bring the weak up. It, it, the, the strong should not be destroying the weak at any cost or should not be destroying the weak at all. And um, population control has become the uh, weapon of choice among some of, our, some of our ideologies in this world. And to me, in my way of thinking, much of the ideology in America sounds, makes it sound like population control is a right and a gift Whereas I really do think that in the minds of some people, it is a subversive way of eliminating various races that the, uh, some elites would like to see lose out. Mm -hmm. um, this is my own personal opinion, but I, it seems to me I can see where birth control is being used in the United States in areas of where people are poor and it's being touted as being an uplifting thing where it is actually destroying communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you look at the early days of eugenics <clears throat> and, um, and, and actually uh, some of this discussion goes back to the middle 1800s um, where by after Darwin, there were those that observed his concept of survival of the fittest. And um, the, the concept of natural selection and basically breeding natural selection. And so eugenics started going into this direction of saying, well, we can improve the human genetic experience by breeding out those who demonstrate attributes that we, thought we find undesirable. And so population control um, was, was kind of a means of doing that. But the label that they used at that time was eugenics. It was later on when, after, particularly after uh, World War II, uh, or going into World War II, and we saw the horrors of, of the, the Holocaust, and we saw the horrors of the final solution that was being presented by Germany, there were a lot of advocates for eugenics prior to that time period until they saw that abuse of power and the consequences that came from it. You know, a lot of times we wonder, well, why does God allow something like world wars? And uh, we really have to think about it. God allows evil for a greater good to come. Sometimes he allows evil so that we'll see exactly what evil is, so that we can then come together as a people and say, we need to provide, we need to be able to prevent that from ever occurring or happening again. And so we have to be able to learn from it. So as eugenics kind of morphed, you know, it found a way to hide itself. That's the way what evil does, is, is that it becomes a bit of a chameleon. And, and it hides itself in, in a variety of ways. But so then we started seeing a surgence of, of uh, some of the same people that were in eugenics now promoting something called population control. And so we encourage people to population control because our world has too few resources, and if there's too many people in it, then, well, there just won't be enough, enough to go around. And that was the concern that was presented for any number of years. And, and I know that when I was, was in high school, um, that was being, that was being and, and in, in college, that was being preached from a variety of, of directions, uh, the importance of population control. Um, and... The thing is, is that, yes, we might be able to see, yes, we need to, to manage that. But, it, and this is an example where I say we might agree on the problem, but there, there's usually more than one solution to a problem. And a solution which causes the death of a life conceived is, it, there's an immorality that, to that solution. We have to consider that life conceived as um, just as the same as we would consider our own life. We, we're called to care for one another, so we're called to care for all lives, and yet 
we can generally come up with a variety of excuses as to why there may be some lives we don't want to care for. So then are we, are we saying that we are so shallow that we would not believe that if God created this world and he created the people that, that are on it, that he would not find a way to create for the need for our needs? That, that we can be, we're so shallow that we, we can't think of God. We just think of, oh, there's not enough to take care of all these people. Well, it is, it is one of those, you know, for example, when we go back into um, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8 and the conversation that Samuel had with the Lord and the Lord responded, you're not the one that they're rejecting. They're rejecting me as their king. So, in our rejection of God, if you will, we reject his natural law. We say, oh, you know, tell you what, God, we're smarter than you are. We can take it from here. In reality, though, God asks us to participate in his creation. He's given us a um, variety of means by which we may, we, by which we may understand his creation. Um, and if we trust in God, then we should also trust the fact that he will guide us through, that he will, he will lead us through. But, of course, if we, if we don't trust in God, if we turn away from him, then he's going to say, okay, take it on your own, see how well you do. And that's exactly kind of what he did here with, with the people at that time. And he told Samuel, listen to the people. Let them have their king. This is what will happen to them. And sure enough, we see those same temptations continue through, through sovereigns and, and, and governments uh, to our very day. Another thing that we should consider is, is, of course, we're talking about some very complex issues uh, as people examine them. And, and we must also remember Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, um, which, is in, which is titled in the New American Bible as the Judgment of the Nations. And it reads, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne and all the nations will be assembled before him. And he will separate them, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. A stranger, and you welcomed me. Naked, and you clothed me. Ill, and you cared for me in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you ill or in prison and visit you? And the king will say to them in reply, Amen, I say to you, whatever you did for one of these least brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. A stranger, and you gave me no welcome. Naked, and you gave me no clothing. Ill and in prison, and you did not care for me. Then they will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or ill or in prison and not minister to your needs? He will answer them, Amen, I say to you, what you did not do for one of these least ones, you did not do for me. And these will go off to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So here we're told in Scripture that we're called to work together to care for one another. So, you know, sometimes we, we may have a tendency of thinking, well, okay, well, if I'm trusting in God, I'll just sit back and let him do everything. And that, that also is not really what he's asking us. He's asking us to participate in his creation. He's asking us to consider one another and to care for one another, to approach one another with humility, civility, dignity, and respect. And as we do so, we can resolve and remove a lot of the conflicts that exist around us. We can find ways to problem solve that will take care of the least among us. But that's what it requires is just that we, we trust that we can come together and we allow ourselves to come together as God encourages us to come together. So as I found the one document um, from President Stephen Mosier, 
I also found another gut document because I started looking up, um, you know, I wanted to find out about the, um, uh, the pop, um, was it the, I forgot what the PRI was. Um, the, the, the Population Research Institute. I wanted to find out more about the Population Research Institute, and I found another document, uh, very critical of them. However, as I read this one, this expert, it says that that anti-choice agenda, says the United Nations Scruggs, is not simply to oppose abortion. Rather, the anti-abortion rhetoric is kind of a code for something more pervasive. These groups are not just anti-abortion, they are anti-woman, and oppose population policies and programs in general, says Scruggs. They hate us because we have been very effective in promoting women's rights and providing poor communities with the information and means to voluntarily plan their families. The pity is, is that refuting these lies takes up valuable staff time we could be using to carry out our primary mandate, saving the lives of poor women, men, and adolescents. Behind their innocuous sounding names and claims to represent pro-life interests, CFAM and its network of like-minded groups, um, other like-minded groups, others include the Pro-Life Action League, American Life League, Campaign Life Coalition, Concerned Women for America, and National Right to Life Committee, uh, have lobbied heavily against women's rights to make their own decisions about having or not having. CFAM was established ostensibly to monitor UN activities in the population and reproductive health fields. But according to investigations carried out by their groups, including Catholics for a Free Choice, what CFAM really does is orchestrate misinformation campaigns against the UN system, disrupt meetings, and brand all specialized agencies and non-governmental organizations engaged in reproductive health and family planning initiatives in developing countries as anti-family. Wow. Now, as we examine the above statement that was published by World Watch in defense of UN population control agencies, we should take a moment to note the language. What do we notice about some of the verbiage? What is it designed to do? It, it's designed to look like people who are uh, against abortion are, are really against women. And, and it, it's designed to make it sound like they don't care for the equality. This was the latest thing. The equality for the poor women to have access to abortion. But it occurred to me, this when I, when I first heard that expression, we need to give poor people the same equality that rich people will have. But in New York City, when six, 60% of black babies are being aborted, does that equality mean that there should be 80% of black babies aborted? I, I don't understand why the term that it is equal access to the poor as to the rich, when the poor, the poorest of the, uh, and the, the black and Hispanic and whatnot groups, but mainly the black babies in New York City, if they had any more equal rights, the, the end is even worse because 60% of these babies are being aborted and equal rights should not mean that 80% of them should be. Yeah. And, and then, of course, when we look at some of the versions for like they, they when they criticize pro-life groups as anti-woman. You know, that, those are, that's a very emotional word. They're, they're anti-women. Um, and, and then they promote themselves because they say, oh, we're providing poor communities with the information and means to voluntarily plan their families. Well, sometimes it's not so voluntary. And even within our own nation, we've had periods of forced, uh, forced sterilizations. And, and those forced sterilizations were designed for purposes of eugenics. And then it was later camouflaged under programs of population control. So when they say saving the lives of poor, when you're killing children in the womb, you're not necessarily saving lives. There's other ways to be able to solve problems of limited resources before we resort to killing one another. 
anyway, that's another area that I could go on for some and some time. But the one thing I want to click quickly mention is that Pope Pius VI was concerned about what governments would do in terms of imposing death solutions uh, upon people. And according to, to um, uh, one article, uh, let me find its name here real quick, it's um, Coercive Population Control and Asylum in the United States by Connie Oxford. She mentioned that in 1980, China implemented one of the most controversial population policies in modern times. China's one-child policy shaped population politics for 35 years until its dissolution in 2015. And during this time, many women were subjected to routine gynecological uh, examinations, pregnancy testing, abortions, and sterilizations, which were often forced upon them by family planning officials. She later said in the same article in 2015, China officially ended its one-child policy, allowing couples to have two children. The end of this policy was fueled by the same concerns that created it, China's role in the current global economy. In an effort to increase the labor supply, China is now allowing couples to have more than one child. Well, it's become a two-child policy, so China is still continuing those abuses of um, periodic gynecological examinations, pregnancy testing, abortions, and forced sterilizations, which were often forced upon them by family planning officials. They continue to do that to this day. And so some quotes I'd like to leave you with as we come to the end of our, our time here. Uh, one comes from Brian, Brian Clois, who wrote Exposing the Global Population Control Agenda. And he makes reference to the Kissinger Report, which is a report that was um, done in the 70s. Um, I believe, if I'm correct, I believe it was done in 1974, um, uh, which was an analysis in terms of the problems of, of population in the world as they would impact the United States. And so he said, according to the Kissinger Report, elements of the implementation of government population control programs include legalization of abortion, financial incentives for countries to increase their abortion, sterilization, and contraception use rates, indoctrination of children, and mandatory population control and coercion of other forms, such as withholding disaster and food aid, unless a least developed country, an LDC, implements population control programs. The Kissinger Report also specifically declared that the United States was to cover up government population control activities and avoid charges of imperialism by inducing the United Nations and various non-governmental organizations. Specifically, the Pathfinder Fund, the International Planned Parenthood Foundation, and the Population Council to do its dirty work. So again, we have to maintain awareness. Um, not only the history uh, of our own government, but our, but our current events, but we also have to maintain awareness of what's happening through our United Nations and other nations as well. Pope Paul VI said in Humanae Vitae, and now we need, wish to speak to rulers of nations. To you most of all is committed the responsibility of safeguarding the common good. You can contribute so much to the preservation of morals. We beg of you, never allow the morals of your peoples to be undermined. The family is the primary unit in the state. Do not tolerate any legislation which would introduce into the family those practices which are opposed to the natural law of God. Are there other ways by which a government can and should solve the population problem? That is to say, by enacting laws which will assist families and by educating the people wisely so that the moral law and the freedom of the citizen, citizens are both safeguarded. And so some final thoughts. During our discussion, we reviewed the purpose, role, temptations, and influences on governments, whether they are led by sovereigns, dictators, or representatives elected by the people. We also noted that those in power do not always recognize their responsibility to God or the children of his creation. From the nature of the discussion, we might be tempted to believe that government is evil. But just like a person, governments also have the ability to do what is right and just. It is a choice. Governments can make good choices just as, just as we have seen they can, that they can make choices to the bad. We might also be tempted to believe that there is nothing we can do to influence governments to do what is right and just, for governments are large, massive, and well beyond our personal means to hold them accountable. And indeed, if we are alone, it does appear to be an impossible task. But as a faith community, there are many hands we can join and hearts we can influence. 
We should also consider that we are blessed to live in a land with a Bill of Rights designed to protect the people's unalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. While we still have the rights to free speech and religion, we must join hands to hold our government accountable to those rights as well as to how our government influences the world. We must educate ourselves so we may know the issues, the influencers, what God asks of us, and with whom we might work. If we are uncertain as to what we may do to help accomplish what God asks of us, we recommend the power of prayer. If we ask God, he will guide us to our opportunities. Well, our time has come to an end once again, and we hope you'll be able to join us next week as we turn our discussion to the rejection of God's design. So let us conclude with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to open and discuss your holy word. We pray that as we go our separate ways, you will continue to walk with us and help us to see how we may put on the armor of truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, and the word of the gospel, not only for the benefit of our lives, but also the lives of all who cross our path. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Thank you all, and God bless. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.